I, I, I say the fact uh, um, uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, welcome Josh Swanson from uh, current USC and uh, we're very pleased to have him uh, and he'll tell us about the methods of harmonic polynomials and hopefully we'll understand what he's talking about. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for the, uh, the invite and hospitality, uh, Igor and Pasha. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the combinatorics of harmonic polynomial differential forms. I'll explain uh, what in the world all that stuff means. Uh, let's see, so this is based on a series of papers, uh, joint work. Um, so let's see, this one is with Nolan Wallach. Uh, it's been published. This one with Nolan Wallach, uh, that will be submitted you know, in a few days. Uh, this one is solo, and that has been submitted. Anyway, there we go. So uh, just a quick outline. I'm first going to give a, an introduction to co-invariant algebras and sort of classical harmonics. Then I'm going to give super analogs of both of those things. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a potential filtration for the super co-invariant algebra, more or less. And as a step towards that potential filtration, I'll talk about some things called Tanasaki witness relations. Um, so my, my hope is to uh, introduce more the, the combinatorial side of, of these objects. Uh, I could go more into combinatorial representation theory, but uh, I decided to attempt to stick more towards the, the algebra and then towards the end of the, the lecture combinatorics. So hopefully that will be successful. Anyway, uh, so covariant algebras are a lovely, beautiful thing. Um, I like to kind of think of some of the initial motivation coming all the way from, from Newton uh, with the elementary symmetric polynomials being an algebraic generating set for the ring of symmetric polynomials, say in n variables here. Uh, so the symmetric group Sn acts on the multivariable, multivariable polynomial ring just by variable substitution extended multiplicatively uh, and Q linearly. And so we can consider the invariant subring, which is just the subring generated by the elementary symmetric polynomials, which will feature prominently in the talk. I'll often uh, not write the of x1 through xn. So uh, actually, whenever Hilbert was, was solving the uh, f first problem of invariant theory, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Anyway, uh, when Hilbert was solving the first problem in, of invariant theory, he actually introduced uh, the Hilbert basis theorem to solve that. Uh, and he considered the ideal generated by uh, positive degree homogeneous symmetric group invariants. And through a, a sort of averaging argument, you can show that uh, that ideal is going to be generated by a generating set for the algebra. And so like he, he showed that these uh, invariant rings are finitely generated by showing that um, all ideals are finitely generated. So this is just kind of, I, I like the, the fundamental nature um, in some sense of, of these explorations. And I tend to think that this says that, okay, if we just quotient out by this ideal, that will be an interesting object. And so that quotient is the co-invariant algebra Rn. So just a uh, random smattering of, of theory. Uh, it's the covariant algebra is beautiful and well studied, um, so it ha it's a presentation for the cohomology ring of uh, the complete flag manifold, for instance. And Burrell told us that uh, Chevalier showed that actually uh, uh, the ungraded representation of um, the co oh, it seems to have stopped. Huh. Fascinating. Technical difficulties. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had requested a, a minor tweak to the usual modality, so I think this is, any technical issues are on me. But anyway, um, okay, so we have uh, the Burrell's presentation of the singular cohomology of the complete flag manifold is, in fact, the covariant algebra. Beautiful old thing. Chevalet. Uh, showed that the uh, ungraded symmetric group isomorphism type of the covariant algebra is just the regular representation. So in particular, there, its dimension is n factorial, finite dimensional in, in very particular. 
Uh, and just another uh, example is uh, Artin's basis. So if you take the monomials, where we have this uh, sort of staircase restriction on the exponents, then that actually gives us a basis for the covariant algebra. And one nice thing that you can read off from this sort of very combinatorial, very handy Artin's basis is the Hilbert series. So the dimension generating function for the covariant algebra uh, is just this product of Q integers called a Q factorial. Uh, so now, uh, that, that stuff is all very well known. Uh, the harmonic side is maybe slightly less known, so I, I will go through that as well. Um, so kind of the, the overarching thought is that uh, it's kind of difficult sometimes to work with quotients just because you don't necessarily know if something is zero. That's always a problem. Uh, so it'd be nice if you could somehow replace the quotient with some sort of, um, like, canonical subobject instead, uh, where it was clear if, if, you, if you were zero or not. So harmonics accomplish this. Um, so the idea is we take a, a multivariate polynomial and view it as a partial differential operator just by replacing the xi's with partial derivatives with respect to xi. And then we define a symmetric positive definite um, SN invariant uh, form by taking two multivariate polynomials, applying one as a partial differential operation to the other, and taking the constant coefficient. Turns out that this is symmetric, and the positive definite is important. So in particular, it's non-degenerate. So we have like this, this ultimately, in some sense, right, very nice um, linear form. And in fact, this can be made uh, very uh, general and and natural in the first of the three papers I listed at the front um, goes through that if you care. But in any case, uh, so we take the covariant ideal, the, uh, this thing, and we look at its orthogonal complement uh, with respect to the, uh, this form. And if you work it through, that's precisely the polynomials, multivariate polynomials, which are annihilated by, say, the elementary symmetric polynomials viewed as partial differential operators. And the key thing is that the map from the harmonics to the quotient is, in fact, an isomorphism. That's basically just because you're, you've taken an orthogonal complement, so you're kind of killing the, the covariant ideal. So, so you end up getting this uh, sort of canonical um, version of the quotient and from my perspective of combinatorial representation theory, um, it's, it's good enough. So this is like a concrete, a concrete model for the covariant algebra. And so just a, a quick example that also introduces a little bit of notation. Um, the, the Vandermond determinant, delta n, features prominently in this talk. Um, so this guy is an alternate, meaning that it transforms by the, the sine character under the symmetric group action. Um, now, if we take a symmetric polynomial of positive degree and we apply it as a partial differential operator to the Vandermond, we end up, uh, like, this operator ends up being equivariant. So it, it stays an alternate, but its degree is lower than the Vandermond. And it's well, very well known that the Vandermond is the lowest degree alternate that's non-zero. So in fact, applying any element of the uh, covariant ideal gives us zero. So that says that yes, indeed, applying the partials with respect to EI uh, gives us zero. So yes, the Vandermond is a harmonic. So this like gives a, a really very quick argument to say, oh, uh, we have like this non-zero element of the covariant algebra Rn, maybe kind of important. And in fact. Um, Steinberg showed that the harmonics are obtained from the uh, Vandermond by applying partial differential operators in all possible ways. And the, the definition of harmonics uh, is actually closed under applying partial differential operators. And this basically just comes from the fact that the ideal is closed under multiplying. So the, the complement is closed under the partial differentiation, so that there's an adjoint thing going on there. Okay, so 
That's the, the little classical intro. Now I wanted to talk about the superspace analog. Uh, so this stuff is much newer. Um, so, or at least people interested in the covariant sort of aspects of this is much newer. Uh, so superspace, uh, I'm going to follow a pretty standard convention in uh, my neck of the woods and introduce these variables theta1 through theta n, in addition to the x1 through xn. But the thetas will be Grassmannian variables, they'll anti-commute. Uh, the thetas commute with the x's, and the x's commute with themselves still. This is abstractly the uh, symmetric algebra generated by x1 through xn, hence through the exterior algebra generated by theta1 through theta n, and the symmetric group acts diagonally on these guys. So, okay. A lovely little object. And uh, recently, uh, a conjecture of Zabraki introduced uh, basically this this object, I'll call it the super covariant algebra. So we take superspace, polynomial ring in these n commuting and n anti commuting variables, and we quotient by the bihomogeneous non constant, the ideal generated by bihomogeneous non constant uh, diagonally symmetric super polynomial. Okay. Um, so the, the overarching idea of the talk is that this is a very interesting object. So actually, uh, Zabraki conjectured uh, quite a bit more than this particular claim, but in, in particular, um, he conjectured the Hilbert series, the bigraded Hilbert series for this quotient, is something involving uh, Q, Q Sterling numbers of the second kind. And so this, this whole expression, Q counts ordered set partition um, with n minus uh, of 1 through n with n minus k blocks, say, as k varies. So, like, there's conjecturally quite a lot of, of sort of combinatorics underlying um, underlying this, just in, in this little Hilbert series, little <laughs> uh, Hilbert series claim. So, uh, I just wanted to, to mention, um, so some of my work with Nolan, uh, we were able to show at least a specialization of this, namely if you set z equal to negative q, you get, it turns out, one. So we've been able to, to figure some of it out. Uh, and in fact, um, this is one of the stronger currently proven results, at least, concerning the structure of the super covariant algebras. Uh, here? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. This should have been a z to the k. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I do that sometimes. Anyway, any other questions? So, no, the proof is pretty algebraic. It's actually uh, type independent. It works for pseudo reflection groups. Um, so we 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 show that a certain uh, complex, um, like viewing SR as a as a complex, is exact. It ends up ends up giving you this. The the proof uh, involves a sort of algebraic variant of the Hodge decomposition, total Laplacians. Yeah. I, I would love a, a good geometric interpretation. I would love an analog of, say, Borel's presentation. Uh, that would be fantastic. If you know anything along those lines or have ideas, please talk to me. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Like, does does z equal negative q mean anything geometrically? I'm not really sure. So it, it, this ends up being a graded Euler characteristic. Um, so like, there's at least like a, hom a homological interpretation. Yeah. Uh, and just to to kind of again hit this point about the combinatorics in this direction being really pretty rich. Um, I I have uh, with ongoing work with uh, Bruce. And uh, Robin Salzberger, Salzgruber, ugh, uh, a type B analog of the Q Sterling number of the second kind. Anyway, uh, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff here that, that we're we're still exploring. Okay, so the title of the talk was harmonic polynomial differential forms. Um, so where are the differential forms? Uh, well, it's basically a, a little notational convenience. So. These theta variables I actually think of as the differential forms. So theta i is dxi. 
uh, and then the product of the theta variables is just the, the wedge product of the, of the form. Anyway, uh, so that ends up introducing a few notions from uh, differential geometry to the mix, or at least analogs, in particular like this Hodge decomposition uh, business. Um, so uh, recall that the exterior derivative, for instance, um, is the differential operator that differentiates with respect to the ith variable and then multiplies that by dxi. Um, so this uh, is an operator in actually on the, the whole superspace. And in fact, Solomon showed that the invariant ideal is generated by, well, first the, the classical invariants and also their exterior derivative. And in fact, there's a, a version of this for describing the, the SN invariant subalgebra as well, but whatever. Okay. So these uh, differential forms end up, uh, I think, clarifying what's going on. So there's this, this notion on differential forms of an interior product, which is basically like a, an anti-commutative partial derivative. Um, so uh, that's defined this way. I'll switch back to the theta variables because they tend to be a little uh, briefer. So it's basically just like the usual partial derivative you're used to, except that there's some sort of a sign rule, uh, which you just have to keep track of. Now, uh, delta subscript theta i k. Sorry, Q? Oh, this. Oh, uh, yes, I hadn't quite gotten to. <laughs> so so uh, we can extend this partial differentiation notion, like viewing, uh, a, in this case, super uh, polynomial as a partial differential operator on the super polynomials using the interior product to replace the theta variables. Um, so in particular, if we have this sort of monomial expansion, we turn it into this partial differential operator. Um, I've, I've underlined here uh, the theta ik and theta i1 just because there's, a, there's an order reversal, um, which is maybe not immediately obvious. It kind of comes from this negative one to the power. Anyway, working through all that, you can uh, now generalize the, the nice, basically canonical um, uh, non-degenerate form that I had mentioned before. Uh, you just take the constant term of the partial differential operator G applied to F. Metric positive definite SN invariant, all that. So the same uh, song and dance works in the super case. Uh, and then we define the super harmonics. So the super harmonics are the invariants. Um, uh, the ideal generated by the uh, bihomogeneous non-constant, diagonally symmetric, uh, super harmonic differential forms, uh, orthogonal complemented, which, if you work it out, gives you this very explicit model. So we want the polynomials, and commuting and anti-commuting variables, which are annihilated by the elementary symmetric polynomials and the exterior derivatives of the elementary symmetric polynomials viewed as partial differential operators. So you end up getting uh, an expression like this, where you have the partial with respect to the partial with respect to xj. Anyway, you just live with it. Uh, the SN harmonics. So the SN harmonics were back over here. Uh, there. The, yeah, so here we were just adding theta variables. Yep. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Great. And so again, uh, the natural projection from the super harmonics to the super co-invariants is a bigraded SN module isomorph. So using the super harmonics is uh, a way to go. Uh, you again get that the um, the Vandermond is a superharmonic, in fact, and all the regular harmonics uh, with no theta variables remain superharmonic, more or less trivially. So it includes the classical covariance. So this is like a generalization and enrichment of that theory. 
And the overarching claim of this talk is that the superharmonics of Sn are just a combinatorially rich structure. And we've seen a few hints of that, for instance, in the Q Sterling uh, Hilbert series uh, conjecture. Um, and I will give more examples for the rest of the talk. Before I do that, are there any questions? Pause for drinks. Yes, Pavel. Yeah, so this is a great question. So whenever you get, uh, so this formula uh, looks like uh, something related to the F polynomial of a uh, permutahedra. Uh, so we have variations of this uh, in type B. Um, yeah, where you look at the, the uh, intersection lattice of the type B hyperplane arrangement. Um, and uh, it actually fails in type uh, in one of the exceptional types, I'd have to look back at my um, at my calculations. It was a little surprising. It was one of the real ones, so it doesn't seem to be completely general, but there definitely does seem to be something there. And and like so, this result actually is type independent, um, though a number of results that we have are not. Uh, I'll get to one later in particular that's very much type A. Um, some things definitely work in general type but a lot of things seem to only work for the reach product. Um, yeah. It would be lovely if there was a way to, to get uh, something along these lines from the geometry of the permutahedron. Um, that's definitely a, a reasonable thing to hope. Uh, nobody's been able to do it. If you're able to, I would be very happy to Yeah, so at least the, so there's, there's sort of an ordered and an unordered version. So the, the, uh, the ordered version is the one that I think has more direct meaning. Um, so it, it counts the number of faces in the intersection lattice of the hyperplane arrangement um, graded by dimension. Yeah. Yeah, so in that interpretation for, again, one of the exceptional types, I'd have to look back at my calculations, uh, did not actually have the right dimension. Yeah, it's in one of those three papers. You can have fun hunting through a, 120 pages to find it. <laughs> or I can do it for you. Okay. Yeah, good questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so I want to continue discussing some of the structure of the super covariant algebra. So uh, we, we have this notion of uh, generalized exterior derivatives. And this actually, this works in all types, but I'm given, giving the type A version here a specific realization of it. So uh, recall that the exterior derivative was just the partials times the dx's. Uh, well, the generalized exterior derivative is just partial differentiate more times. Um, in particular, d1 is the exterior derivative. And in fact, we can use uh, these generalized exterior derivatives on superharmonics. It's not obvious that these guys preserve the superharmonics, um, but one can show that in fact they do. Um, and so we can, we can apply these generalized exterior derivatives. Also, uh, because they're in theta degree 1, they anti-commute as operators, so you can sort of Imagine the, the algebra generated by them is going to be an exterior algebra, or a quotient thereof, maybe. Turns out to be free. Uh, so in any case, it turns out that the alternating component of the superharmonics um, is precisely obtained by applying the generalized exterior derivatives in all possible ways to the Vandermont. Okay. So, you know, this is this is getting, I think, more combinatorially interesting. We have multiple generators. I'm going to use this d sub i delta n notation, by the way, because this di1 through dik gets a little tedious to write. Um, so uh, Nolan and I have a conjecture, uh, which we call a differential operator conjecture, generalizing uh, the, the previous one I'd mentioned for the, the harmonics. Um, and that is that the harmonics 
are obtained precisely by taking an alternate, so one of those guys on the last slide, and applying partial derivatives with respect to the x variables. Okay, uh, we've, we've verified this in sort of accessible cases, and we have um, various partial results towards this. Um, so it's, it's true in the extreme theta degrees, 0, 1, n minus 1, and n. Uh, of these, for what it's worth, 1 is probably the most interesting, but whatever. Um, also, this is, this is one of the actually stronger results um, known in general about the superharmonics, um, the supports of the Hilbert series, the bigraded Hilbert series of both sides of these agree. So at the very least, we kind of know the shape. Whether or not there's maybe a, a few extra things hiding in shadows is, is unclear at the moment. Uh, we really don't think so. I'm, I'm... Oh, no, this is for all. Uh, so, for all uh, theta degrees. Yeah, and so by this I mean like it's literally true for those theta degrees, and then this is true for all theta degrees. Yeah, and the proof of this uses uh, combinatorial manipulations and some algebraic stuff involving Ar Ar Arten and Grobner bases. Uh, we actually generalized this to the, the complex reflection groups G, M, P, N, uh, which required defining Arten and Grobner bases for those. The Arten bases there involves some mildly interesting combinatorics. I won't discuss any of that. It's in the papers. Okay, so that conjecture, uh, I think, motivates this flip action. So we have an action of the polynomial ring in n variables on superspace defined just by acting by the partial differential operator. So back over in the differential operator conjecture, you just kind of want to take these, harm, these alternates, which again were all of this form, and close them under this action. So uh, if we just, so we get some like cyclic modules if we want, using those sort of conjectural top guys. So I'll call SHI the, the cyclic module generated under the flip action by that alternate di delta n, explicitly that. And just restating the differential operator conjecture, the superharmonics are the q x1 through xn module generated by those 2 to the n minus 1 generators. OK, so then this leads to a question of what are the relations between these module generators? So we're trying to understand what this module actually, actually is, so understanding the relations between them. Uh, is a reasonable thing. And this question is where the combinatorics, I'd say, starts to get uh, a bit more interesting. So just a few examples. Um, first off, uh, these di delta n's, they were superharmonic. So in particular, they're harmonic. So in particular, applying uh, an ei gives you zero. So that's one very straightforward relation. Um, and this actually says that the, the, the qx1 through xn action actually descends to an action of the co-invariant algebra, whatever. Um, I wanted to go through this example, which, which starts showing, uh, again, some of this combinatorics more. So uh, if we look just, for instance, at n equals phi 3 and theta degree 1, uh, it turns out that the additional uh, relations for this flip action are generated by these observations. So partial x1, x2 applied to d2 delta 3 works out to be 0. And partial x1, x2 applied to d1 delta 3 works out to be partial x1 plus x2 applied to d2 delta 3. None of this is at all obvious. Um, you, should, you, you, you have to go and, and write this stuff out. The, oh, yes, that cancels, or, or like, oh, yes, all of the terms are, are killed by everything, but it does work, uh, along with the uh, images of this. So apply, you know, every, every permutation of S3 to these relations. 
And so the, I think one possible way to try and imagine constructing the uh, superharmonics is kind of add one of these generators at a time and close it under this flip action. Add another generator, close it. Add another generator, close it. And each time, see what you've added that's new. Um, so in this particular case, we, we actually get a filtration uh, by taking first the cyclic module generated by D2 delta 3, and then uh, taking both uh, generators. And if you think about it, it turns out that um, this claim says that the composition factors are precisely isomorphic to this particular quotient of qx1, x2, x3. Namely, you have the, the usual e1, e2, e3 uh, covariant algebra generators, and then you also have these x1, x2, and their symmetric group images. It's, again, it's not obvious, but if you, if you think about the calculation enough, this is what you end up getting. Um, so, in particular, uh, we have, for instance, that the dimension of um, SH31 is twice the dimension of this quotient. Uh, okay, so these quotients, it turns out in practice, at least... Um, We've been able, in many cases, to identify these quotients. Uh, and so that involves Tanasaki ideals. So Tanasaki gave a presentation generalizing Borel's presentation. Um, so for the, the Springer fiber, the closure of Springer fibers uh, has singular cohomology um, isomorphic to this explicit presentation, which I'll call R mu. Uh, where the, the presentation is the n-variable polynomials divided, uh, quotiented out by uh, the Tanasaki ideal, I mu. Tanasaki ideals have a number of descriptions. Uh, Garcia Prochese's work uh, gives a, a lovely description of them. I actually have a, a different equivalent description of their generators, which I find more memorable and at least directly useful. Um, so the, uh, it's this. You take uh, the usual covariant generators, uh, here, by the way, I'm using uh, notation N underline for X1 through Xn, uh, just because it's, it gets tedious to, to write too much of that. Uh, and then you add a few extra generators, which can be obtained through a combinatorial process. Uh, and this example uh, describes it perfectly fine. So here we have some partition mu uh, 5, 3, 1, 1, 1. Now uh, we write i is the column index starting at uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then d i. We start at 1 there, and then we add uh, the number of boxes not in the first row to get to the next one. So we go 1 to 5, we add 4. So then the next one we add just this to get 6, uh, then we add 1 to get 7, and we have nothing to add, so we stay at 7. And then these end up being the degrees of the elementary symmetric polynomials you use as you lower the number of variables. Oh, there's a small typo. Be a 4. There's another thing I like about doing it on my own tablet. Typos can be fixed instantly. Okay, so, and it turns out that this guy over here is in fact the Tanasaki quotient R21. And in fact, the Tanasaki quotients, they're, they're lovely in many ways. Uh, so, like, their dimension is the multinomial coefficient given by mu. So, that gives us a nice dimension formula immediately for this per very particular component. Okay. So, a little more generally, going beyond this, this sort of small example, uh, the situation that we've found ourselves in is that we have 2 to the n minus 1 generators, and we also have these Tanasaki ideals, R mu. If we allowed the mu to instead be a weak composition, then we would have 2 to the n minus 1 of them. 
So we have this sort of immediate enumerative coincidence uh, of sort of indexing sets are, are feeling, feeling similar. Uh, if you combine a bunch of, a bunch of things from um, Zabraki and our work and um, Haglin, Rhodes, and Shimizono, uh, who are the, the main, uh, main instigator of this question, you end up asking the following question. Do we have some sort of a total order? So can we add generators in some prescribed order uh, s along with some bijection from those subsets to weak compositions where the composition factors are precisely Hanasaki quotient? So the annihilator of the composition factor needs to be precisely the Hanasaki ideal indexed by the image under this theoretical bijection. Uh, here, I should say, I'm just defining uh, the Tanasaki ideal of a weak composition to be the Tanasaki ideal of the weakly uh, decreasing rearrangement of it. Okay, so one way to access this conjecture is to ask, ask for specific relations um, between the, the top guy, the SHIM term, and the lower guys. So on the level of the harmonic forms, that would just correspond to some relation where we're able to take some generator of the Tanasaki ideal, apply it to the, the generator uh, of our super harmonics, and get elements in the lower uh, pieces of the filtration. So this we call a, or I call, I guess, solo author paper, a uh, Tanasaki witness relation. Okay, I will give examples. Um, yeah, so the question is, what is the relation between this question and probably the Zabraki's conjecture? So, Unfortunately, like, there's several conjectures. So there's this, the differential operator conjecture also would need to be true. Um, uh, so we'd need the differential operator conjecture and we would need an affirmative answer to this question to solve that case of Zabraki's conjecture. Uh, one nice thing about this approach is that it would actually give more generally, um, uh, well, so it would give the graded Frobenius series, which Zabraki also conjectured. Um, and it would also give a, a basis, like an implicit complicated basis, but an explicit basis. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, so the question is, is it known that if I sum up all these Tanasaki Frobenius characteristics, am I going to get the other thing in Zabraki's conjecture? Um, Zabraki's conjecture is basically the statement that you do get that. So, so it is not known. Um, yeah, that would be very interesting. And Zabraki's full conjecture, by the way, generalizes the, uh, like the Nabla EN formula for the graded Frobenius of diagonal covariance. So in full generality, it's considered very difficult. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, this is kind of a little speculative potentially. Uh, it turns out to be true for n less than or equal to 8, uh, which is a good starting point. That's, that's a bunch of quotients that had to work out just right. Uh, th though I will say the order is, is a bit mysterious. Uh, and if anything, that's like the biggest stumbling block for me to, to further progress. Um, so the uh, reverse lexicographic order mostly works, but in a few cases you have to reorder some terms. Not clear to me what is going on there. Um, but I will present further evidence for the, the interest of this uh, approach in the next few slides. And I should also note that these uh, relations are actually quite complex. Um, so like here's just one example relation for n equals 7 and k equals 2. So we have, you know, all of these these different sort of generators or hypothetical generators of the super covariant um, or super harmonics, and we're applying all of these different uh, partial differential operators um, involving the E's in a whole bunch of ways, and we have these 
somewhat, um, in this particular case, the coefficients are perhaps maybe reasonable. In larger cases, they would probably be harder to guess. Uh, we have some sort of a graded positivity. Uh, they, they seem to be alternating. Like there's, there's a whole bunch of combinatorial structure, uh, just like in this particular relation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, so the, the difference between the first row and the second row, uh, so all of these guys have six as the last entry. These guys have five. Oh, yeah. So the sign seems to be alternating in each of these rows. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and all of the examples that I've found have a sign alternation property. So like there's a, a graded positivity statement, um, most likely, uh, underlying this. But one of the issues is, well, the question, what are all of the relations, period? The, it's not quite like an expansion coefficient. It's not quite that well defined. Like what are all the syzygies? Anyway, uh, let's see. Right, so we have uh, true like that. Uh, yes, yeah, so it would give us a basis. Um, and this turns out that uh, if all the conjectures, most of which I skipped um, to, to get to this position, were true, we end up getting this purely enumerative claim, um, this bivariate generating function involving uh, um, number of elements of subsets on the one hand, and these weird statistics, okay, maybe that's not so weird, but this statistic, I would say, is relatively weird um, on the other side. Uh, it involves co-inversions co and, and this B of mu, uh, the dimension of, of X mu, for instance, is a variety. It's this important thing that comes up in this theory all the time. Okay. Uh, as a starting point, something that I can describe coherently and quickly, uh, we, I, we do have a bijection. So the, the question uh, back over here, is there a total order and a bijection? So I have a bijection that verifies this. So the bijection seems pretty solid. Uh, and in particular, the, the bijection does send the relevant statistics to the, to the other statistics. So it provides a bijective proof of, of that formula star on the previous slide. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so here's a, an example. Um, so in fact, it's easier to describe the inverse bijection. Um, so if we, if we start with 1, 3, 2, 1, 1, 3, 1, then the way to figure out the subset i is uh, first, uh, so ignore the first column basically, fill the second column, six, five, four, three, two, oh. Oh, sorry, this was supposed to be reverse. There we go. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, six, five, four, three, two, one, and zero. Mm -hmm. Have to fix that later. Anyway, uh, but skipping the ones that you actually skipped, and then um, so kind of ignore that, like delete that, kind of compress this together. Now this will be like 9, 8, 7, and skip the 8. Anyway, something like this. There's like a recursive combinatorial filling procedure, which ends up giving you this um, sort of magical formula. Okay, so the main evidence that I have that this is an interesting direction to pursue is that I have a bunch of relations, a bunch of Tanasaki witnesses. And this is really what I wanted to get at. And this is this is my current justification for the claim that the superharmonics are combinatorially interesting. Um, so first, I have what I'm calling the generic Pieri rule. Um, so that is, uh, if we pick a, a completely arbitrary subset of n minus 1, then we get a relation 
starting at that uh, subset um, where we interlace. So we consider all subsets whose, when written in increasing order, interlace between the original subset. And for each of those, uh, we consider the, that superharmonic alternant. We apply this particular um, partial differential operator in these elementary symmetric polynomials in one fewer than all of the variables. And the coefficients are indeed just negative one to the, the d. So here this d is just the difference between the sum of the j's and the sum of the i's. So this is sort of the, the graded commutative or the graded positivity that, that seems to be um, that seems to come up a fair amount here. Uh, why I called it the generic Pieri rule? So it's generic because it's for arbitrary i, and Pieri just because it's multiplicity free, ignoring the, the plus or minus. And also, you know, we we have these these e's, sort of special e's are being applied. So it's similar at least in a few ways. Okay, so the proof, oh, oh no, sorry, I should mention that. Um, so a corollary of this generic theory rule, it actually at least does completely work. It makes the whole thing work for SHN1. Um, so that's, that's nice uh, if, we, if we use this um, uh, reverse lexicographic order then the composition factors indeed are annihilated precisely by, in this case, these Tanasaki ideals, i2, 1 to the n minus 2. So just not quite a vertical uh, script, one, one little box over from, from that. Uh, and in particular, combining it all, you do get the graded Frobenius series of this guy. Uh, this, this expression is certainly known, um, uh, at least, anyway, yes. So, so we do at least get this. You can read off then also the, um, the Hilbert series. And so actually, I was, I was led to analyze this particular case uh, from more or less probabilistic uh, reasoning. So uh, it turns out that, uh, so if you fix uh, the theta degree and let n go to infinity, you can sort of ask yourself uh, what fraction of alphas um, are of the form that this relation is the, the only uh, extra generator of the Tanasaki ideal. And it turns out that the generic Perry rule in a, an appropriate asymptotic limit does give you uh, fraction one, probability one of those. So, so in some sense, the generic Perry rule should give um, uh, like most of the necessary relations. Uh, and I wanted to briefly mention the uh, it's three minutes, I think, uh, just a, a few words about the proof. Uh, so it's completely combinatorial. Uh, it uses what I call the marked staircase diagrams. So we kind of combinatorialize the terms in in these um, in these elements. Uh, so we take a sort of staircase diagram that represents a term in the Vandermond. And then we, we make some x's, which represents applying certain terms in the, the generalized exterior derivatives. And then uh, we, we make some circles, which represent some terms in the partial with respect to elementary symmetric polynomials. So all these things kind of come together. And then they have signs, and there's a multiplicity, and whatever. Um, it, you end up getting uh, relations on these marked staircase diagrams of several sorts. I just gave some examples. I won't discuss them here. Um, but in any case, uh, if you, so the, the proof uh, basically groups together marked staircase diagrams in certain somewhat complicated ways and ultimately recursively defines a sign reversing involution. It's all kind of magical that everything just works, but it does. Okay, and then in my last two minutes, I wanted to mention on the other extreme, I have more complicated uh, Tanasaki witness relations. Um, so I won't actually discuss all of the, the gory details, um, but for certain very particular types of shapes that are uh, hooks uh, with a, a few extra boxes in the second column, um, I have 
basically the the necessary Kanosaki witness relations for those. Uh, so in any case, uh, we have these weird coefficients involving evaluations of Vandermonds. It, the proof is significantly more complicated, involves an action on marked staircases. And so, yeah, I'm left with wondering, uh, what are all the Tanisaki witness relations? Can anybody come up with a combinatorial description of their coefficients? Is there some sort of a reason why we have this graded positivity? Uh, lots, of, lots of interesting stuff, I'd say. Okay, that is all. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Igor. Go for it. The super diagonal setting? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so certainly uh, Zabraki's conjecture uh, generalizes to a very specific QTZ uh, trivariate thing. Uh, and in fact, the um, sort of the, the general version of the, the um, Sterling number side uh, ends up being this expression coming from the delta conjecture of Hagelin, Remmel, Wilson. Um, so, so that generalizes, certainly. Uh, it's not obvious, and like the, that expression... Um, depending on which version of that expression you're talking about, like it's it's not clear that it's QT symmetric necessarily. Um, whereas uh, the so the the on the left hand side the super diagonal analog of the covariant algebra uh, is going to be clearly QT symmetric. You just have you know x1 through xn, y1 through yn, and theta1 through theta n. X's and the y's are sort of clearly interchangeable. So yeah, all of that stuff certainly generalizes. Um, uh, a lot of this other stuff, though, the, the stuff based on viewing um, x theta i as dxi, um, it's maybe a little less clear uh, if that, in any sense, should generalize to a, a three sets of variables case. Um, yeah. And, and also, like, we, we haven't looked in that direction nearly as much. I will, I will definitely say that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go for it. Yep. Okay. No, I have not. Yeah, no, I have not talked. I've not talked with people who do, you know, Taurus knot sort of stuff uh, to get their interpretation. Yeah, no, I totally agree. The diagonal covariant story is, and this would definitely be a, a good direction to go. And why I'm giving talks about it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and this that space definitely does come up. That the the super space with the x's and thetas at least. Um, that one is, I don't know, 40 years old. It depends on who you're talking to. If it's older than that by certain measures. Yeah, this particular quotient. Um, nobody... Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely something uh, I should talk to, to people who know something about, uh, yeah, not theory. <laughs> 